Um, do you want to maybe say your name yeah. and what you had for breakfast? Sure, that's the classic, isn't it? Yeah. I actually had, <laughs> I'm going to sound pathetically healthy, I had granola with fruit and milk for my breakfast and a glass of water. Nice. It was great, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm a huge, it's not, it's not a healthy guy, I just really enjoy fruit. Um, and... Uh, uh, yeah, and I quite like granola, which is not, yeah, it's quite, apparently a recent thing, perhaps in the last six months. But yeah, yummy. Hello, and welcome to the Ask the Industry podcast, episode 29. For those of you new to the show, this is the podcast where I interview the most influential people from the worlds of stand up, comedy, radio, TV, and today, education. Oliver Double is a former comedian, although he still occasionally practices the art author of the book Getting the Joke, and Canterbury legend. He also teaches comedy at the University of Kent. I got him on to talk about the history of the art form, how it's changed over the years, his book, what he would change about it, what he would add to it, and also a lot of really interesting things about how the government's Arts Council cuts and fundings have changed, how it has changed to become a professional comedian, what becoming a professional comedian means, the advent of comedy on TV and how that's affected the live circuit and a lot of people's careers. And it's just, it's a really good episode for comedy nerds. I think this one will appeal more and more, should we say, mainstream audiences. It's really good for performers, but it's also going to be, I think, quite good for anyone who is not a performer, who is just massively interested in the history of comedy, the history of theatre, the history of uh, vaudeville acts, and just in general how art has changed within the UK and globally over the course of the last hundred years or so. I really had a bit of a nerd on with him and I really had a lot of fun. He also told me after the podcast that he's added this podcast to the University of Kent's reading list for future comedians, which is amazing because that means we're on Jill Edwards' uh, reading list for her future graduates, for performers who are learning down in Brighton and also for graduates down in Kent. So we're growing and uh, we're getting into some really great places. So thank you very much for all the support, everyone. I'm going to keep this very short because I'm at the Edinburgh Fringe Festival and as you can probably hear, my voice is going and I need it for a show in about four hours. So uh, if you'd like to support the show, please do share this with someone that you think will enjoy it. It doesn't have to be a comedian. It can be uh, a normal person. It doesn't have to be a comedian. It can be a civilian or someone who's just a comedy nerd. Please keep sharing it because it really helps out the podcast. And uh, the more people that hear it, the more it really helps the audience and it figures. Just keep sharing it. It'd be great. If you want to support the podcast financially, you can become a patron. From as little as one dollar, it's about eighty p. So it costs you two pound forty for the month to keep this project going. So if you're enjoying this and you'd like to become a patron, please do. It really helps out, and it gives me a budget for every show. If you'd like to just do a one-off donation, uh, just go to my website, which is simoncain.co.uk. S i m o n c a i n e. Co. Uk. There's a big PayPal button in the top corner. Just hit it and send me whatever you think it's worth. You know, one pound an episode. If you listen to ten episodes, ten pound. £2 an episode, listen to five episodes, £10. You know how mass works. I'm not going to patronise you. So, yeah. Uh, also, if you haven't already done, please review it on iTunes. we got some really good new reviews on there. It's great. We're up to 33. I'd love to just keep that growing and keep that going. So, please keep reviewing it if you haven't had a chance to yet. Take a minute, pause this episode, pop on iTunes and just give it whatever star rating you think it's worth. Don't, I mean, give it five stars if you think it's worth five stars, but rate it honestly and give it a little bit of a review. I do read them and uh, I'm not going to hunt you down if you say it's four stars, but it'll probably, I mean, if it's four stars and it reads like a five, I'm happy with that. Let's just stick, keep, stay that. Anyway, we did this episode in a pub, which has meant that there is a little bit of background noise, but I have spent an inordinately large amount of time editing to make sure that is at its minimum. So it is actually, it's workable, it's 100% hearable. Is hearable a word? It's 100%, li you can listen to everything, it's fine. Um, so without any further delays, this is Oliver Double. You've, you've, I assume you've been media trained a little bit, because you've done, no? Oh. I've, 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 done, I've done enough things to know how things work, I think. Right. Basically, I'm going to ask you the first question, yep. and then I'm going to keep quiet. If you could answer the first question with the first question in it, so yes, do you know what I mean? Yes, I do. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Uh, it's fine. I, uh, no, I know. I, I know the convention. Yeah. 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 Um, so, for <laughs> okay. There was two first questions I was going to start on because I thought I'd be quite flippant and go, "What's the secret to being funny?" 
And I, it'd just be quite fun to break. But there's no point in asking that one, is there? Um, I'll, I'll sort of start with... Um, I can answer that one if you want. Would you like to answer that one? I can. Go for it. The secret of being funny um, is... It, well, it depends on what you mean by being funny. Do you mean being funny in any context? Or do you mean being funny in front of an audience? Because I think the secret of being funny in front of an audience is to do with creating... A, a, a rapport with the audience where they believe that you're funny and that sounds simple but it's actually really difficult and you can be an experienced act and it suddenly all goes away it sort of evaporates and you can't nothing you say is funny every word sounds dead as it comes out of your mouth um, but it's to do with making the audience believe this is on and I think that everything else there's lots of other things like material and, uh, I don't know, um, audience manipulation and all kinds of things. But the key to it is that relationship between performer and audience. If you can get that, everything else can find itself, I think. Do you think, because like, say I'm watching someone on TV, like, a, like a, just think of a TV name, doesn't matter who, and I watch them on TV and I think, that would never work in like an open mic comedy, whatever, or like that would never work in a 30-seater thing that I'm doing at the moment. You know what I mean? Is it mm. because people just trust that name because they've seen them enough? Uh, I, that's a really good question. I remember when I first started doing stand-up, when I first started doing difficult gigs, I, I, I thought, oh my God, you, you just need to be bulletproof. You need really great jokes that are tested time after time after time. You need to get to the punchlines quickly. You need to boom, boom, boom. I don't think I ever quite lived up to those aspirations, incidentally. I mean, I remember, you know, I had some jokes which were kind of quite torturous in the setup. So the one, I used to speak really quickly because you needed to be able to get there so that you could get to the punchline without it being five minutes later. But the point, the point I'm coming to is I would listen to archive recordings of people like Jasper Carrot, which is quite delicate. You know, his early stand-up is quite delicate, sort of observational, anecdotal stuff. And I would think... Oh, that's, that, that would never work in a comedy club. But yet he started doing his stand-up in folk clubs where I don't imagine it was necessarily all that easy. I mean, he played in, you know, some of these places were rugby clubs and things like that. I imagine he was capable of dealing with a boisterous audience. So, I, you know, I think sometimes you look at something and go, that wouldn't work in another context. But you don't really know that until you've seen it in another mm. context. Yeah, totally. I've got, um, I'm, got, I'm talking to Earl Oaken, who's coming on soon, and uh, he was telling me that like, when he started, and he still does, primarily folk clubs, and he's like, they're not easy. Like, you'd think, you know, you, think you sort of look at comedy crowds and you, you, know, you have sort of um, uh, ideas of what they like and what they are, and you think, oh, he's doing music, so even if it's not funny, kind of thing, and you're like, no, he gets billed as a comedy musical act, and so it still has to be, you know what I mean, spot on. Absolutely. Probably, probably how it differs is that the audience have slightly different expectations and slightly different habits in terms of how they respond. I remember I used to play occasionally a uh, circus cabaret in Leeds, right? It was just in a, in a pub. Right. But you, you'd get, I mean, I remember, I remember doing it one time and Lee Evans was topping the bill. It was just, just been about the time that he was first starting to break through. Uh, but that was unusual because it was like, like lots of stand-ups on a bill kind of thing. But I remember sometimes you'd play it and there'd be like a, a, a you know, a black light UV act or something. You know, and you'd go, wow, people love this. But if you put this into a comedy club, they'd be off within two minutes. Yeah. Um, but also the, the other aspect of that was because they liked skill and they liked novelty. There were bits that you would do which are perhaps a little bit meta and playing on the conventions of comedy where they just didn't get that because they didn't know the conventions of comedy as well. But they would just be delighted in a different way, so the laughs would perhaps come in slightly different places. I think I think with musical comedy that's particularly so like if you if you watch a musical comedian, they always get a round of applause at the end of every yes. song. And I, I think even if you have a killer joke, you're not necessarily always gonna get a round of applause. It, and so it's sort of like you're getting pleased in a different way, which means you Yeah, absolutely. I mean I think I think um the, 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 I mean, there are certain different, obviously lots of different types of applause, and one of them is the ritual applause, which um, comes when you come on the stage, when you go off the stage, when you finish an item. Um, but, I mean, it's interesting, if you listen to uh, the Now show on Radio 4, even though it's a satirical show, occasionally they'll finish a bit, and, it, and it's a really clever bit. You know, it's actually properly satirical and quite thought-provoking. I was listening to it last Friday and I can't remember what, the, what it was they were talking about. It may have been Jeremy Corbyn or something. And they actually had a really interesting take on it. And then at the end, one of them just goes, thank you. And everybody applauds. It doesn't make sense quite in that 
in yeah. that context because it hasn't been like the end of a song where you strum the final chord and go boom mm. and that cues the applause so they have to sort of a, but I think it, it, it does make sense in the sense of that thing is not supposed to be like a, it, it's supposed to have the feeling of a gig as well mm. I suppose that show so they need to have those moments of transition and so they cue in a slightly ham-fisted way or, or heavy-handed way anyway the, the, the applause at the end of it but so there is the ritual thing I think that does exist in stand-up but not in very not very commonly so for example Bob Newhart you know his sketch his routines were he would do an introduction and it, it, it would you know which would set up the idea and then he would do the the, the, the bit the routine would be Shelley Berman was a bit the, the same as well the, the, the bit would be a distinct bit like like doing a song and so when they got to the end of the bit there would normally be applause but that's because it was structured slightly differently from most stand-up. So there was a distinct introduction and a distinct bit. But I think any time... It's a bit like, you know, performing poets used to be big on the old, early, early days of alternative comedy. You finish the poem and you get applause. But the other interesting thing about that is that um, ritual applause... The, the ri- yeah, you kind of go... Everybody applauds somebody when they go on stage, but not all, it's not always been the case. In Variety, they only used to applaud the well-known acts coming on. And in fact, the, 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 what was called the second spot comic, the comic that went on for sort of like, let's say, eight minutes after the, after the opening dance act, uh, would sometimes leave to applause at the, as well as... Uh, sorry, leave to silence as well as coming on to silence. And there was an old, um, there was an old expression, um, going off in your carpet slippers, something like that, meaning you didn't have to go off to the sound of your own feet because you wouldn't hear them because you were in slippers. Uh, and in fact, one of the reasons they used to finish with a song was to try and cue the audience to to applaud. What started that then? Why did they start clapping? Like, what was the? I don't know. I I just think that 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 um, I think that uh, audience behaviour changes over time. I mean, it changed from the music hall of the nineteenth century to the variety of the twentieth century, and that I do, I do know the reason for that. That in in music hall. Um, uh, audiences were m- audiences would come and go. They wouldn't come for the whole show, um, so that uh, the, if the show was say four hours long, the program would advertise what time each act was on stage. So if you wanted to catch a particular act, you knew what time to arrive. Right. Uh, and like, so at a, was, like at a festival. Yeah, yeah, I guess it's like a festival, yeah. or, or you know, it, it, it would be like a cross between going out to the pub and seeing a show because you went there to drink and eat as mm. well. At least at certain stage in music hall history. And some people went for another reason, which was to, to get with prostitutes, right? And so, so that, that there was a huge social element going on. And so people would chat through a lot of the acts. And, and that must have been very difficult for the, for the performers because they had to try and silence people before they could get applause. Mm. And, and there's quite a lot of accounts of that happening. And yet when it moved, when, by the time you get to sort of early 20th century variety, when it was shorter shows twice a night... The audience wouldn't do that in the same way. They were much more like a conventional theatre audience. Mm. And the reason was because... Uh, the, the, well, one of the reasons was that, that, uh, that uh, theatre licences changed, so you couldn't serve alcohol in most venues within the auditorium. So suddenly the drink sales are outside of the auditorium. And, and so that, that social element starts to disappear. Also, it's a shorter tie to show where people come for the whole thing. So I suppose it, it, it makes the audience slightly more passive and less likely to just chat amongst themselves. Why it's changed to now, I don't know why people applaud people on. I, I don't know. It's, it, there, there must be some reason, but I'm not sure what it is. I've noticed in like music, for example, like the bands have a change over time and they don't really, they sort of have that awkward... Do you know what I mean? Like where they're yes. setting up and there's no applause in that time. Yes. And then when the band comes out, they don't always applaud. Like when, yeah. when there's like a, a support act, for example, sometimes if you don't know who the hell they are and you're not really there for them, it's a bit awkward for them until they start. And the only reason that there's no sign, the, the, the silence stops is because they start playing. Whereas with comedy, the MC is always like, give them all your love, give all the, you know. Could- well, I think the MC, actually, maybe that's it. Because in Variety... If, there were shows that had an MC, but actually, in a lot of cases, the the acts came on with no introduction. So um, the way it worked was each act had a number on the bill, and at the side of the the, the stage on, on the proscenium, there would be either a painted sign or later light bulbs, and it would sort of say the number. You'd look in your program and see which act it is. So, uh, and and the way the the bill was constructed was such that that you came out during the applause for the previous act. 
Right. But obviously, if that hadn't started happening yet, because it's early in the evening, and you know, mm. the, the trajectory of the evening is that people applaud more as, you know, as the evening progresses. Mm. Uh, but because there's nobody introducing you and building you up, then maybe that's why it's, it's much more normal. And, and often, in mu- you know, music shows, partly live music shows, partly grew out of variety, weirdly, in this country. I mean, people know about the blues, they know about you know, um, country music, but they don't necessarily know that when uh, Cliff Richard first started touring as, a, as, 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 you know, as an act, he would go with the, you know, he'd play in the Finsbury Park Empire or whatever with a full bill of supporting variety acts. I mean, the people he attracted didn't necessarily like the fact that he had <laughs> variety acts on with him, uh, but, uh, but that's how it, how it works. And in fact, when, if you follow in the trade press what happened after all the theatres shut down in the late 50s, um, they talk about variety being one-nighters. And when you look at what the one-nighters meant, what it meant was a night with maybe a singer two rock and roll acts and maybe like a comic comparing and then that was called a one nighter because in variety you played for six nights two shows a night for six nights and then the Sunday was travelling to the next show but a one nighter is obviously as it sounds you know it's, you, you do one night and then on to the next thing mm. yeah totally I mean I had um, Peter from Downstairs at the King's Head on a few weeks ago mm. and he was talking about how his night's still rooted in variety like he still has bands on he still kind of tries to keep that alive and I feel like a lot of nights now just focus on just having four or five stand-ups on. We've got a thing at Kent. We've started a thing, the British Stand-Up Comedy Archive. And it's still comparatively modest, but we've started targeting venues because we got Monica Babinska's stuff from the uh, Meccano Club in the, in the 80s and 90s. It's fantastic, her archive. It's got her bookings book. It's got you know photos of comedians. It's even got the <laughs> massive 80s mobile phone that she <laughs> bought to contact the acts. You know. And um, when you look back through bills of the Meccano in let's say 1990 you look at it and you go well okay there's a there's a comic there's a double act there's a poet um and there's maybe a singing act and that's the night when I used to run uh the last laugh comedy club with Roger Monkhouse in Sheffield in in the 90s we would have two acts and then us comparing and then maybe an open mic spot and that worked that was enough but actually, you know, quite often you'd get Henry Normal doing a poetry act. You'd get perhaps an impressionist. You'd get a magician, possibly. You might get somebody who did a sort of juggling act. You might get a two, a, a, you know, a two-person sketch act. It was pretty varied, actually, what you would get. And I think that possibly that that variety aspect, that new variety aspect, which cast really sort of promoted in, in, in the 80s and 90s. I think that's, that's disappeared in favour of pure stand-up to some extent, mm. which is kind of a shame because there were some brilliant... I mean, Henry Norman was a brilliant performance poet. He was really funny. It was very like stand-up because he used a lot of stand-up techniques. But he would do delicate poems in there as well as funny ones. Mm. And they worked as well. Mm. Kind of Tim Key style or...? I don't really know Tim Key's work okay. very well, so I don't know. But he 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 he, he was good. he looked quite gothy. Henry did, right. and he had a really brilliant self-effacing sort of deadpan style. And he, he he was based in Manchester at the time. He didn't come from Manchester, but he was based in Manchester. So he played on that whole Man- Manchester thing mm. a bit, like taking the piss out of it. Yeah. And uh, he he was just a great act. I mean, it you know it's funny. Uh, there was another great act as well, uh, Kevin Cisse. This was a guy whose parentage was partly African, like his dad was from... Oh, I can't remember what, what country his dad was from now. It might have been like the Gambia or somewhere. Um, but he was, a, he was a proper Manchester bloke who did, who did music slightly in the vein of Billy Bragg. And he was a very deadpan, very, very good deadpan comic as well. And some of the songs were really funny as well. And then some of them were quite serious, quite political songs. He did a song called The Angry Woman, which is a sort of feminist song. And he was a great act. He was fantastic. He used to do brilliant jokes because he, he was very dark-skinned and he, and he had a shaven head. And uh, he came out with, um, with like a plaster on his forehead. And he'd say, uh, these flesh colour plasters are brilliant, aren't they? practically invisible that was like his opening line and uh you know th- those acts i mean I, I think particularly outside london you tended to get more of those acts those kind of acts didn't quite fit the, the standard sort of like stand-up model and 
they, they, but they were brilliant acts. I mean, Hovis Presley was another one. There was a guy in Manchester called, I think he was from Bolton, but he was called Hovis Presley. He died a number of years ago. I think he had a heart problem or something. And he used to do these incredibly deadpan, dour northern poems. And um, uh, I remember seeing him, right, and he's, a number of times, his, his opening poem was like a kind of confessional loser love poem. So he comes out and he goes, and he, and he does all this kind of quite lyrical, northern, gritty love imagery about, you know, a, a woman is unattainable. And, you know, and he, he says all this, quite, quite, and, and, you know, by the time he gets to the first gag, you're going, oh, God, this is a comedy club. I don't know if he's remembered. <laughs> and then he'd go, he'd do all this imagery, and he'd just pause and he'd go, your boyfriend's a gormless twat. <laughs> huge laugh, just huge because of because of building that moment, mm. he was great, you know. And um, I think it's kind of a shame that something like Go Fast Strike wasn't around at the time. It didn't. You know, I'd love to know if there was another. There was another amazing one, Bob Dillinger. Bob Dillinger, unlikely as it sounds, right? His act was that he would do essentially old gags dressed up as songs that were sung in the style, roughly speaking, kind of a northern Bob Dylan, right? right. And uh, but just brilliant performer. Again, quite deadpan, quite self-effacing. And just would tear the house, you know, it would, would tear it, tear it, tear the audience up. It was just brilliant, brilliant acts. And these people, sadly, are kind of largely forgotten, but they were fantastic acts. Yeah. I know Stuart Lee talks a lot about the acts that were around when he started on the circuit, but I think, you know, there, there, there was a whole, almost like another group of people who were based further north or outside of London who... who haven't necessarily been particularly well remembered. Rory Motion, right, there was this guy who played a Yorkshire hippie, a guy, his real name was Andy, and, and he, he used to do songs and, uh, um, again, quite deadpan. There was, there, was a, there was a thing of gentle, gentle, slow-paced, deadpan, subtle, but he used to do songs, poems. He also used to do, like, stuff with a dog puppet. Like, he would bring out this puppet and do stuff with the puppet and things. And he, I mean, I remember one of his jokes, his typical Rory Motion joke. He'd say, oh, my dad was, my dad liked fish and chips. He said it was a very spiritual dish because the fish represented the Piscean age and the chips were to fill you up, right? <laughs> and it's a great joke because if you stop and think about it, it's, it's a rule of three joke, but with two items in the list. Yeah. The first item is, is, is sets up the expectation just enough that you don't even need a third one. Yeah, yeah, you just yeah. bang and then it comes out. Yeah, totally. And I mean, Stuart Lee is always like pigeonholed as like altern- the alternative comedian yes. that like made it through, as it were, and is now sort of mainstream, but still sort of the the hidden. Do you know what I mean? Like he's yes. he's in that cusp area of like. I mean, I, I, people argue he's not now that he's got his TV program, but I still think. I, th- I mean, I asked my dad who if, if he knows who he is, and he watches a lot of comedy on TV. He'd bypass that whole thing. So as a result, I mean, it's kind of it, it's still. I feel like he's still got that. Thing and uh, sorry, go on. Oh, well, I was going to say, I completely agree. I think I think t- with Stuart Lee, it's interesting, and something that he's talked about is that he has to manufacture a sense of being an outsider and a failure, and, a, and, a, and, a, and to have reason to be bitter. Mm. And it's incredible how he still manages to do it, given how successful he is, mm. and and also to be honest, how brilliant he is. Um, uh, you know, uh, I, I saw him quite recently, and it was just. And the other thing is, that every time I see him, there's something to astound there. I love that moment in performance, and I love it particularly in popular performance, which is often denigrated and, and considered lesser than, I don't know, performance art or legitimate theatre. But I think that you get more moments where it's we're not in Kansas anymore moments, where you're watching it and you're going, I didn't expect to be here. I don't know where we're going. I don't know, I don't know how this is going to turn out, but I'm enthralled. And there yeah. was at least one moment when I saw him recently where I was just oh, this is amazing this is God I, I, I feel like I know this is obviously a bit but it feels like it's just happening now and it won't happen again and it didn't happen before yeah. and, and, uh, um, but, but I think that is part of what he does I think he has to that's part of his comic identity and in fact going back to his early DVDs there's, a, there's one of them where he's wearing a, a Sandinista badge now the Sandinistas were you know a core cool celebre of the left in the kind of late 80s through to, I guess, the early 90s. You know, the left-wing government that, that, that sort of got rid of 
the, the, the oppressive fascist regime there and then, were, then you know, went through a democratic election and did all this incredible reform. Um, but, you know, they had, they had suddenly the government hadn't been in power for an awful long time when he was wearing the badge. But to some, to some extent, it's not that. It's a symbol of saying, well, this is of a time. You know, I'm, I'm harking back to a time when perhaps there, were, there, were, there was a clearer sense of right and wrong and the, the political boundaries were perhaps more clearly drawn in comedy and in life. Yeah, totally. And he's, he's always got these little... I mean, I know what you mean about the moments, by the way. Like, I, I'll go and see... There are certain acts I'll go and see, even if I've seen them do a set a hundred times, because I know that at some point they might do an improvised bit or they might go off script. And usually it's more about that for me than the joke again, because I could probably tell them that joke after about 30 times of hearing it, you know what I mean? But it's when, it's when you know, someone drops a glass or, or they notice something in the room and you're like, this is never going to happen again. This is a moment I get to keep with me. And, and that's, that's something I really, str- I really want to do more of those. Do you know what I mean? But I know you can't manufacture them, but you can sort of leave. I mean, like, there's a bit in my show where I leave impro of this bit. Do you know what I mean? Because there's always that. Yes. But the problem is now I've done, I've done 32 previews, right? Sort of lost the improv. Because there's, so, there's only a certain number of things you can do in certain... You know what I mean? It's I frustrating do. now because I'm like... But what I'm talking about isn't just improv, though. I mean, sometimes it's just... I like I've not heard this before. I've not heard anybody talk about this thing before. Or try an idea that audacious or that weird or that abstract. I I, I teach uh, at the University of Kent, mm. and you know, uh, the, you know, the main thing you're trying to do is get students to be able to do it. So you mm. put them in front of an audience, and then you feed back to them and see. You know, you try and get them to the point where they can do it more often than not. Mm. You're also trying to encourage them to develop their own voice. But you know, these 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 are people of. 21 years old normally most of those a bit older than that you know it, 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 and, and you know their, their, their experience of seeing comedy might be quite limited you know they're not going to surprise you that often but the moments they surprise you are delightful and I remember seeing I remember seeing a, a, a student we had a student about nine years ago who all he lacked was the will to be a comic to do the hard footwork that's needed in terms of talent he was all that. There was a guy who d- who done. There was a television guy came in to watch the show one week for, for obscure reasons, which I probably don't need to go into. And he done a lot of stand up, cheap stand up shows for the early days of Channel Five, when Channel Five used to put a lot of stand up, you know, stand up for the comedy store. This guy had done that, and he said that guy after seeing one of their just regular nights, they do a weekly night, they have to do new material every night. He, he saw that and he said, That's the, that is the most exciting new act I've seen. But this, this young guy was brilliant, um, but he just, you know, he just didn't have that, that killer thing of, I'm going to do it and do it and do it and keep doing it. But there was one night, I remember it distinctly, there was one night when he came out and he started talking about, he was out dre- shopping for clothes and he, I think it was like he fell over and hit his head and then he, he woke up, or maybe it wasn't even that, he, he woke up and he was a woman. And he told this whole story about being a woman and seducing a ginger-haired heavy metal fan, right? And, and I, that was one of those we're not in Kansas anymore moments. It was like there was a logic to it, but it was so weird. And th- bear in mind, this is not a guy who's, who's, who's got any political points to make about, about sexuality, really. About, 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 he's, he, was, he was a straight guy. He wasn't a cross-dresser, as far as I know. Um, but it was just... Wouldn't it be interesting to look at life through this angle? So I'll, I'll develop this whole fantasy sequence where that's exactly what I do. And I like those moments where you just go, that's, that's an extraordinary act of imagination, and I would never have thought of that. And I, and I feel privileged to be taken to somewhere that surprised me. Yeah, yeah, I know what you mean. I, when I, if I meet someone, and my favourite comedy, my favourite type of comedy is... A person that does something that I know I couldn't write. Not yeah. As in, yeah, do you know what I mean? I not, not that I'm arrogant enough to think, oh, I could definitely write those jokes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But when I see someone and I think, how have you even yeah. got to that? Yes. Because I don't even know. Like Sometimes you see someone and you think, oh, I could probably see how I would have started or I would have seen that and yeah. it would have made me think about that. But then you see someone and you go, where, where? Like, and you just, and my mind, and uh, as, as uh, before even when I started comedy, I was looking at people just sort of going, but I don't, I don't know... I love it, but I don't know what's going on here, and I don't know how it got here, but I'm happy that it's in my life. You know what I mean? I completely agree. Yeah. Um, but yeah it, there's the occasional joke, you just go, Harry Hill used to have a joke. It, it, a complete non sequitur. It came out of nowhere, it went nowhere. He just goes, if mama loved me, why is she no breathing? 
Then why is that funny? <laughs> I don't know, but it's it's just it's quite dark for him as well. It's, it's yeah, he used to have a fair number of dark jokes. There was a thing about uh, they had to turn off his granddad's life support machine because they needed the plug for something else. Yeah. I mean, you know, yeah. there, there was a, I like that about him because it's very silly, but I think that if you put... Uh, Milton Jones is the same, actually. In case mm. he has a really dark joke in it, it kind of adds a, a sort of piquancy to the... You know, to, to, to the... You know, it's something else. It's a contrast from the silliness. Mm. Yeah, totally. And I mean, the thing, the thing is, I feel like some of that has been a bit lost because the way that maybe TV in particular has sort of selected different people to go on TV, it's kind of done... I don't think it's done on variety as much as it should be. It's sort of done more on... Um, not. Qu- I mean, it was recently... There was a whole thing about BBC and quotas and, like, you know, putting on yes. a certain number of female acts, a certain number of ethnic acts, all that kind of stuff. And it just doesn't feel like... I, I don't. I'm always torn whether. I mean, I'd love to know your opinion on whether you think it's um, the shows that have been on for a while, whether they're now attracting a certain audience that wouldn't want different. Because you know, you know, like some people, they go to work, they come home, they just want to put on buzzcocks mm. because they know what they're going to get, mm-hmm. and they don't want any real. I mean, they want different guests, but they don't want too many different mm. guests because they kind of want it to be almost the same and formulaic. Or whether it's the BBC, you know, for example, commissioners not taking a risk on an act yeah. that could be weird. Yes. I don't know. I mean, Buzzcocks is an interesting one because obviously it's just been cancelled due to lack of interest. Mm. And, and actually, I think that was a great panel show. Mm. It, 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 out, it survived other ones which were perhaps more popular for a while. But I think that maybe the thing with that, that I think the chemistry of those panel shows is really important. I think one of the reasons that, um, that uh, Have I Got News For You has been so long-lived is because the chemistry between Hislop and Merton is so brilliant. And even when Angus Dayton went, it, it still survives. I think, for me, I think Rod Gilbert's great, but I'm not sure he was the best host for that. I think that the best host is one where you can kind of get some... I think for that show, they needed to just look like they genuinely cared about music. That was, that was a thing. Uh, and I think they had to have good chemistry with the, the team captains. And I don't know, maybe, maybe the formula got tired. But, but your question is a different one. Your question is that, uh, is, is, is um, you know, would people put up with it? Well, i tell you something. This is going to make it sound like I'm striving for right on points, and I promise you I'm not. I promise you I'm not. People, that we, we were talking, I was talking recently about, about the fact that... Um, uh, the, every couple of years, a journalist will write an article. Maybe once a year. Uh, where are all the women comics? Oh, is is is, is you know is com- comic you know is, is comedy opening? Is stand up opening up for women? Now there have always been female comics. There, you know some of the biggest comic stars of the music hall were women. Mari Lloyd, uh, Vesta Tilly. You know th- th- these are big names. Mid twentieth century, you have people who are now forgotten who are brilliant, brilliant comics like Suzette Tarry. Um, and so there have always been women comics. Um, and in, in the early days of alternative comedy, there were people like Pauline Melville, who was a brilliant comic. And, um, but, 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 but this is genuinely true. I think if you don't... If you, if you think that women are only getting on TV now because of quotas, you've not been paying attention. The, the, some of the best, most exciting, most individual voices that have been coming out in the last few years, I think, have been women. Josie Long, amazing. The first time I saw Josie Long, I went, I've not seen that before. I've never seen that before. It's, it's a new thing. And I've seen male acts doing things where I've gone, that's like Josie Long. Um, Bridget Christie, it's, what a brilliant thing. Who'd have thought that you could get a feminist act that was so daft, right? D- d- and the daftness of the feminism work perfectly you know, through through the through the friction between those two things comes the comes the comedy. Uh, there's some just brilliant acts out there. I, I really, I, I probably shouldn't I probably shouldn't come out with a list because if I do, I'll just forget people that I know are brilliant. <laughs> Catherine Ryan, very exciting act, so brilliant. But I mean, even 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 sort of really mainstreaming acts. Sarah Millican is an amazing comic. I think if you just watch her on TV, you might not realise quite how amazing she is. But the thing that I love about Sarah Millican when you go and watch her is that she has a constituency who come and see her who perhaps wouldn't have come to that much comedy before. There's a lot of middle-aged and older women who go and see her who, uh, I don't know, Frankie Boyle wouldn't speak to, probably. 
who Michael McIntyre probably wouldn't even speak to. But Sarah Millican's going out there doing some pretty risque stuff, quite taboo stuff. But the thing is, it's not even just her talking. It's her talking and listening. And women making quite extraordinary confessions. Sometimes they're there with their daughter. And the daughter's looking around going, Bob, I never knew you did that. And there's something fantastically feminist about that. Mm. Brilliant. I mean, but in a very different way. I think Catherine Ryan talks to young teenage kids in the audience, young girls, and talks to them about what it's going to be like for them as they grow older as women. And she just has amazing things to say and is extremely funny and is a brilliant physical comic and all that kind of thing. Uh, and, And I just think if you think that I mean, it's true that there is an issue about women getting on television. I think the formats aren't very female-friendly. I don't think that... I, I'm not a massive fan of Mock the Week because it's a combative thing. It's, it, it, I, and and that's, that's not an atmosphere I've ever thrived in. Um, I think in some ways I'm quite feminine. I mean, it sounds a bit daft, but I grew up in... I mean, I grew up as one of four kids. I've got an older brother, but he left home when I was 14 and my parents were separated. So I grew up in a very sort of female environment. And I feel like that kind of rubbed off on me. You know, through and through my teenage years, I was surrounded by women and I heard their perspectives on things. Um, and, and I just think that there's, there's so many brilliant women comics out there at every level that it's ridiculous to think that, that, that it's even... We shouldn't even be talking about our women, you know, is stand up something women can do. Of course they flipping can. You know, I mean, I mean, to give another example of somebody who's a very established comic from the other side of the Atlantic... Maria Bamford is an extraordinary comic. I mean, you know, absolutely has her own voice. There's nobody else I, I think that's a, around like her. It's not just the voices thing. It's the fact that she talks about things like anxiety and depression with such obscure references that it's almost surreal. And yet the audience goes with her. You really have to concentrate on it. And she says some pretty thoroughgoing things at the same time as being hilarious. Um, and I think, you know, I, I, I remember seeing, I won't say who it was because it, it probably sounds a bit derogatory. And I don't mean to sag somebody off, but I saw a very, very famous British comic doing a bit in a, in a, in a warm up show for a tour. And, and this guy had a, a laptop on the stage and he showed, and he, was, he was talking about, oh, I love seeing this, I love seeing this. And he shows the image from the laptop behind him. And I'm going, oh, what? You mean like Josie Long loves things that she shows on a pad that she's drawn herself? You mean that? You mean you talk about things being life affirming like Josie Long used to do three or four years ago? Mm. You know, it, I, I, don't, I don't blame him for picking up on that. I think it's actually a brilliant idea because the natural bit of comedy is cynicism and to talk about things you hate. Mm. So to talk about things you love is kind of an interesting yeah. di- dynamic. I don't blame people picking up on, what, on, on Josie Long's positivism. Um, but it's just, it's just, you know, women are setting the pace. As, you know, as well as being good acts, they are actually innovating and setting the pace. And I think if you don't acknowledge that, you've not been paying attention. See, that's really interesting, because, like, um, do you think... I mean, I don't know that comic, and I don't know how long they've been going for. Yeah, it's somebody who's very well-known as Bigo for a long time. Well, here's the thing, then. So could it have been that they were doing it before Josie and no. Joe? Cause, oh, no, <laughs> no, I don't think so. I'm, I'm, not accusing, I'm not accusing anything, but you know what I mean? Like, it's always fun that when someone sees something for the first time, they assume that the person they've seen it from is it's, the person who came up with it first. No, because it's not that person's core style. Okay, fair enough then. No, but do you know what I mean about that? Where, where I do, I do completely. No, yeah. and actually, to some extent, I, d- I don't like those things where they go... Like, I'll give you an example. Um... Henny Youngman, right? American one, like King of the One Liners, yeah. right? Um, it, the, the the line "Take my wife, please, take my wife, please," right? That's attributed to him to the point where there's a live recording of him towards the end of his career, and he goes, "Take my wife, please," and there's a bit of a laugh, but a huge applause. Mm. And you go, they can't have liked the joke that much. No, what they're saying is, well done for thinking of that joke. That's a famous joke, yes. right? But it's possible that Henny Youngman heard it from somebody else. It's possible other people definitely did that joke. And, you know, in folklore, you know, I think, I think, I don't know much about folklore studies, but I think that it's right to say that they've gone away, they've moved away from the idea of the urtext, the, the original version of a story, because it's almost impossible to say. Stories mutate and change, and there's the idea that there's only a certain fixed number of stories anyway. And the same is kind of, kind of true of jokes. So, for example, there was a 19th century clown... And he left behind his book of jokes, and it was published a few years ago. And there's a joke in there where he waxes lyrical about something, 
And then it's a bit like the Hovis Presley example. Mm. He waxes lyrical about something and then he says, uh, have I got a clean shirt for Monday? Right. And it's, 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 a, it's a bathos joke. It's from the sublime to the ridiculous. But it really reminds me of that Les Dawson used to do very similar. The structure of the imagery is very, very similar. Les Dawson's was... Um, and as I looked up at the sky, you know, with the stars cast like quicksilver across the, the purple velvet, I thought to myself, I must get a roof put on this outside toilet, right? Yeah. It's the same thing. It's bathos. Is it the same joke? It's the same basic structure, but is it the same joke if you've moved the furniture about? When does it become a different joke? Mm. So to some extent, that thing of who thought of it first is a silly game mm. because you can never ultimately know mm. or tell. There might always have been somebody you didn't know who did it first. Mm. But I think what I'm talking about is not so much a joke as a basic comic principle, yeah, yeah. a basic vibe. I think there's something going along, going on with Josie's act, which is to do with earnestness, craft, DIY culture, uh, positivism, anti-cynicism. Mm. That, that when that came out in that context, I think was something fresh that she hadn't taken from other people. It was just... A new, like a new thing that then people could take, and, and just don't. I don't want to. I don't want to. I don't want to sort of be mistaken. When I saw that thing, I don't think everybody would have been going. This is a Josie Long bit. I think what they would have been, they'd have just gone. This is a really funny bit. Mm. It wasn't like obviously a Josie Long bit, mm. but when you stopped and thought about it, it was just the. It was the basic way of thinking. Mm. It's um, it's kind of interesting because I was I was going to sort of lead you towards the idea about um, social media and how, for example, on Twitter. It's sort of it's become hell because immediately when anything happens, there is enough of comedians on there that every joke gets thought of within about ten minutes, and then there's some really good people out there that about an hour later have something amazing to say, and then about two hours later, everyone's sort of not copied it but either had something very similar to say, or they've sort of rehashed something that's already got like four hundred retweets, and it's and it's just a I, d- I mean it, it's kind of interesting that I mean when you were a com- I mean did you have that when you were a comedian you stopped before it was even a no social I mean I stopped doing co- my last regular professional gig was in 1999 uh, at the um, uh, the Frog and Bucket in Manchester and I didn't shower myself with glory actually it was a pretty shit gig where I messed it up right at the beginning and had to work hard to get them back by the end, which I did, but, you know, it, it felt like a draw, <laughs> a no-score draw, really, rather yeah, than... Yeah. Ironically, two weeks before, I'd done Alexander's in Chester, and it had been, a, you know, absolutely cracking gig. Uh, but anyway, the point I'm coming to is um, that, no, no... I mean, even the internet was early days. I mean, people didn't really make jokes about the internet because no, very few people had access to it. Um, and... Um, I, there was a thing, I mean, it's interesting that, though, the thing about the spread of jokes, because there was a thing, not so much in professional comedy, but in, in the comedy that's shared in life, disaster jokes spread like wildfire. Like everybody knew the joke about the space shuttle exploding in 1986, like two days after it happened. Now, how was that possible? The same jokes. You know, what's, how do you make a NASA cocktail uh, a teacher's and seven up, right? That, 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 you know, that was, everybody was saying that. Um, and how did that spread? It was always a mystery to me. I had a theory that there were like, like five really sick guys in a basement with a typewriter and, and some couriers. Yeah. Mm. Apparently, the, one of the ways that those jokes spread was that um, before the internet, people had um, uh, ticker tape machines, and they would sometimes at the end of a you know a businessman, at the end of um, like a, like a proper business message, they would just put a gag in for their mate in another city or whatever. Apparently, that's hot. Po- partly how those things spread mm. but I can't believe that was all of it no because how could the same jokes be spread in different secondary schools up and down the country how would that work yeah. I don't know no it's, it's I think it's more impressive when they happened offline than online yeah. do you know what I mean I do because online you could just I mean I could email a joke to 500 people in one button yeah. and then it's and then they've all got, I mean they're not all going to talk about it or like pass it around but you've got I mean and also the joke's got to be sort of I, I don't know how to describe it, but it's going to be funny enough and accessible enough and well, the subject matter is going to be well-known enough that everyone wants to pass it on. Do you know what yes. I mean? Because you can't, it can't just be, like you said, with like Maria, for example, something so um, untalked about or, uh, I don't want to say underground, but like something that where not everyone maybe is comfortable talking about or even passing on a joke about it. 
Yeah, I think I think I think those kind of jokes that get swapped have to be have to be short as well. I mean, obviously Twitter encourages that, but interestingly, there was a, there was a bunch of jokes, Tim Vine jokes, that were swapped online for many years, mm-hmm. wrongly attributed to Tommy Cooper, and you still occasionally see them getting touted as Tommy Cooper jokes. Seems to be very, really annoying for Tim Vine. Mm. Um, uh, that, that that would have been an early example actually of those jokes spreading, but of course Tim Vine's style is very prone to that because the jokes are easy to pass on, they're easy to transmit. Um, but it's, it's also quite humbling online. Uh, when I first started teaching comedy, I always assumed that nobody would nick jokes, that they would always want to write their own. After a very short while, I realised, oh, no, these are, these are stolen jokes. They've stolen these from somewhere. And actually, what I do now is if, if a student comes out with a joke that sounds suspiciously good, and if it's short, I'll Google it. Right? And occasionally, like, like a couple of years later, I'll go, I bet that one was as well. I'll Google it and go, yeah. yeah. <laughs> And then occasionally you, you Google it and you go, no, it's not, it's not. And then the other thing that happens is occasionally you think of an idea for a joke and you go, somebody's got to have done that already. And you Google it and then you have three hits already. And you go, yeah, okay. Even if it's not a comedian, you know, it might be on a forum or something. Yeah. Well, in your, in your book, you talked about how uh, there's actually no prerequisite to write your own jokes. There's a, like, it's not actually something like you, you, you're supposed to, but like there's no hard and fast rule for... Well, d- historically... Um, people didn't write their own material. I mean, at least some did, but some didn't. I mean, in, in the days of Music Hall, which is the ancestor in this country of, of stand-up, uh, as opposed to America, where it might be affordable in minstrel shows or whatever, um, in Music Hall, it, they, they sang songs, but there were bits of comic patter in there. Generally, they worked with writers. Sometimes they wrote their own material, but generally they wrote with writers. They worked with writers, and the writers would supply the basic raw material. But somebody like Dan Lino, who was known as the funniest man on earth, uh, who, who was born in, I think, 1860 and died in something like 1904, he uh, also talked about uh, a new... Oh, no, somebody else talked about it in one of his... Um, in one of his... Um, Obituaries. Somebody talked about how a new piece of material for Dan Lino was never that much fun because it wasn't very funny. It was only after collaborating with an audience at night after night that he would find the extra details, the extra bits, those bits of improv that stay in. And that doesn't that to you sound like a stand-up working in a new mm. bit of material? Yeah, totally. And so, so, uh, so presumably all those bits that are added, they're his. Mm. But the raw material came from a writer. Certainly within, uh, within Variety, um, people like Max Miller would just... Some of it would just be jokes. Some of it were jokes people sold to him at the stage door. Sometimes he might have worked with a writer. Frankie Howard worked with writers, for example. Um, and uh, th- and uh, the Working Men's Club comedy, people... There isn't even an idea that you should write your own material. It's just, it's just what you come across. Mm. I heard this joke. This guy tells me a joke. Mm. This bloke walks into a pub, blah, blah, blah. Englishman, Irishman, Scotsman, blah, blah, blah. Right, I'll tell that one then. On, on, um, there, was a, there was an incident, very interesting incident in the early 90s when Jack D was doing his early telly stuff, which is great. It's the early Jack D telly stuff is brilliant. Sort of it's, it's an object lesson in how to do stand-up on, on TV. They just set up a, 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 a comparatively small, intimate venue he came out he did his 20 minutes of jokes yeah i think he normally had a guest spot normally a singer but i think occasionally a stand-up i think lee evans occasionally guest on it bob's your uncle you know you just see the whole encounter it's really worked well material really well honed really well written anyway um there was they revived the comedians the, the working men's club comedy showcase that started in 1971 they revived it around that time and one of the acts came out pretty much joke for joke, a Jack D routine he'd done in his show. And Jack D complained. It was in all the papers, or some of the papers anyway. And this guy said something very interesting. He said, if you don't want people to tell you jokes, don't tell them. Right? That is the ethos in working men's clubs. There isn't that same notion of authorship. And actually, even in the early alter- alternative comedy days, people like Tony Allen worked with some traditional ma- material. He worked with material that came from doing a Speaker's Corner, Hyde Park. But he also uh, worked with his mates. They would workshop ideas. So, so the, you know, even, even early alternative comics would sometimes work with writers. Uh, the, I- the idea that it all has to spring from the individual genius of the comic, I think, is... Well, I think it originates with early alternative comedy. Um, 
But of course, that's a taboo now because you do get big name comics and it'll say written and performed by X. Yeah. Whereas in the industry, everybody knows X works with another comic and they workshop the ideas. Mm. And the poor old other comic doesn't even get a, a, you know a credit in writing. They might get paid, but they don't get a credit in writing. So how are they? Get, how's that going to work on this on their CV? Yeah, yeah. And I mean, Stuart Lee came out virulently yes, against did. it recently he when he said that they should all be stripped of their uh, awards if, they're, if they've not written the show and it should all go to the person who actually did the work I mean I, mean, um, I, mean, d- d- uh, uh, I think he was quite brave making that public because I think I've been aware of it f- for some time and people have said to me well as an academic why don't you write about it and I've said well I don't know where you get the evidence from who's going to you, you know big name comedian X doesn't want this to be known so you're not they're not going to give you an interview about it their writer's not going to talk to you because they don't they they don't want to be out of a job so who are you going to talk to about it get an anonymous sort of you know source but that's more journalism you know yeah i mean i don't in a way i don't know why it's well i don't know what i don't know what the source of shame is i mean jack d built you know his lead balloon he built the writer into the show into the you know the fictional Mm. version of sort of a slightly less successful version of him in the show, it, you know, the, the writer becomes a character in it. Well, I don't know why that's a shame. Why, why is it a source of shame that you work with a writer? Why, you know, traditionally comic writers have often worked in pairs because it's easy to bounce ideas off each mm. other. I don't think there's any problem in, in, in comics working with writers, but I think they should be acknowledged. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Should be, it's a, um, Gary Delaney a while ago, like, sued Cicopedia, I think it was, or yeah. something, because all of his jokes have been, like, put up there because he's a one-liner yes, guy. Yes, of course. Very, very, very susceptible to that. Yeah, and, and his style of some of the one-liners are a bit of the vein of Cicopedia, of which, which means that they went up and they, they got credited to the person who uploaded them yes. rather than him. Yes. And so now they have to credit, you know, authors on there and stuff. And it's, and it's just interesting that... Um, for me, anyway, the internet sort of changed it. Changed the game in that way because because there's so many you can pass on jokes so quickly that you forget the first person who did it, and it's not always easy to track that, and it's also too much effort to track that sometimes for people to even bother. Well, I'll tell you what, the, there was a taboo about nicking material when I was on the circuit, as the almost certainly is now, I imagine. Uh, the only things that you could take were comparing lines and heckle put downs, and they were common property, and. I don't... The only time I consciously, like, nicked jokes was where I went, OK, I'm comparing this regular gig. That would fit with this topical story. I'm only going to do it in this thing. And then sometimes, if it went well, that would kind of creep into my act. And I, I could think of maybe two jokes where I adapted source material from somewhere else. I felt pretty bad about it. But occasionally, I would get accused of nicking material from somebody else. And I remember a particular act who I got on really well with, who I'd known since I first started on the circuit. And this guy accused me, uh, who I met first when I first started doing professional comedy nights on the circuit, who was a really nice guy, uh, got on with really well. And he, in a really nice way, he wasn't mean about it, but he kind of accused me of doing a gag, which was one of my best gags at the time, being similar to his. Now, I happen to know that I did it first because he, I know that he'd seen me do it before the night that he accused me of doing it. And I know, because I'd seen him a lot, that he hadn't done his one that was vaguely similar in before, you know, I'd never seen him do it before. But the thing is, you, sometimes you see something, you don't remember hearing it from somebody else. Or sometimes it's just parallel, you just both got the same idea. But it would put me in quite an awkward position. And it is kind of annoying. I also remember doing a gag, a, a, a really obvious gag about a meatloaf video, right? And, and I remember it stopped working, and I even remember getting really aggressively heckled about it one night. And I thought, there's something going on here. Maybe somebody else has done it, and I'm not aware of it. And then, uh, I don't know, six months later or something, I saw the video of Badil and Newman at the Wembley Arena, and I went, oh, David Badil, that was who it was. The reason we both thought of it was because it was a really obvious joke, and I definitely hadn't seen it do it before because I'd not, I'd not seen that show. Mm. Uh, but I obviously had to drop it from the app. Mm. But I also I, I remember seeing the, 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 I remember seeing at the Banana in Ballam uh, at the time they were running an upstairs and a downstairs, and you did one and then do the other half mm. and the other. And I remember seeing two two acts. It was Mark Mayer and Bob Mills. Both did a Robert Maxwell thing when Robert Maxwell, the newspaper proprietor, died. 
and pretty much joke for joke, the same jokes. But they were kind of jokes that were there in the ether waiting to be discovered. He was a large man. So it was like, oh, well, they, they mistook, mistook him for a landmass. You know, that was one of the things. Because he, he yeah. fell off his... Well, either threw himself off or fell off his yacht. Right. So gag for gag for gag, it was pretty much the same. And they were doing opposite, opposite halves of the, mm. the Balam banana, right? And both of them hit a hole in the road when they got to that bit. And they compared notes afterwards. And they both went, oh, do you say that joke then? Oh, do you say that joke? Yeah, yeah. Oh, what a thing. That's, that happens sometimes. It's not because people are nicking. It's just because the jokes are kind of... It's not necessarily... I'm not, I'm not blaming either of them for doing obvious stuff. They were both funny routines. It's just that sometimes people come up with the same idea. I mean, it's a bit like when Pe- Peter Capaldi was, was cast... First, first really, was going to be Doctor Who. It's obvious. Mm. It's obvious yeah. that they were going to do jokes about... Everybody was going to do jokes about sweary Doctor Who. That's the first thing anybody would think. Mm. It's the um, give enough monkeys and typewriter yeah. kind exactly. of thing. exactly. Yeah. But I think... I think... Uh, like, because there's... I, I mean, every, I think everyone at one point has been either accused of or been mentioned that they've done a joke that was sim- or a style that's similar to someone else. Sure. Just because there's so many of us now. Of course. And there probably was even when you were on yeah, the circuit. Yeah, absolutely. That you just think... I mean, it, 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 Twitter is an exact example of that, where, you know, something happens and you all of a sudden you go to the trending topic and there's 20 jokes that are almost identical. Yes. And it's... But I mean, I feel like there's like a nice way of doing it and I feel like there's a... Yeah, dick way of doing it, yes, and it doesn't sound true. like that person was particularly dickish to you. But it's uh... no, he wasn't. He was really nice about it. But but I just felt awkward because at that when I was on the circuit, I was really, I was very, I found it, and I'm, I was, I think I was, I was, this was a lot. Of this was was me rather than other people. But I found it quite competitive and ladsy, which it was in places, but I think it wasn't in others. And I wish I'd been more myself backstage talking to other comics because I think I would have got on a lot better with, with a lot of the people I was working with if I'd have just opened up a bit. And I think that, in, you know, at that point, I, I just didn't have the, the thing to say, well, hold on, do you not remember when you first saw me I was doing this joke or when you saw me at this show I was doing this joke? Um, but I, uh, maybe I did, I can't remember. But in my memory of that, that, that event... You know, I, you know I, I just went, no, I, I've definitely thought of this. I, I thought I was doing this in 1991 or whatever it was, you know. Yeah, totally. And you were talking before about that performer from nine years ago who, like, just didn't have that drive to, to, yeah, yeah, yeah. to, to just become a comedian, mm-hmm. which, which you need, really. I mean, like, more than anything. Well, not more than anything, but, like, with a lot of other stuff. Yeah, a- I, I, when I was writing Getting the Joke in, in the mid noughties I hate that name for a decade. It's the wrong name. We should have come up with a better one, but it's come and gone now, and everybody knows what it means. Anyway, um, uh, there was, yeah, um, the, uh, the, there were various things that have happened since then that I wanted to put in the second edition, right? And, so, and when I wrote, first wrote it, I wrote it partly because there was a load of stuff that I came up with students all the time, and I couldn't send them anywhere to read about it because nobody had written about it. I'll give you an example. The thing that I call instant character, which is that moment where you leap out of being a narrator and you go into, even if it's just for a sentence or half a sentence or just a word or a face, you, you just demonstrate another character. It's like a person or a thing or an object or an animal or whatever it is. Um, like, like, there isn't, as far as I know, a fixed word for that in the industry. Nobody, ever, we never use one anyway. I've come up with diff- I've, I've come across different words. We, the instant character was just the thing that I came up with talking to students. I kind of hope when I wrote Getting the Joke that that would become a thing that people would start calling it, but it's failed, so I have to live with that. Anyway, I call it instant character. That's an example of it. But anyway, one of the things in the second edition I really wanted to put in was a thing to do with what happens after you've started that, that helps you to make it. And there's a thing that I always say to students is there's three things you need. You need talent, you need persistence, and you need luck, right? Uh, some people have really lucky breaks, and it kind of happens to them really quickly. I can think of people who talked to me and said, oh, I did a workshop, and then three weeks later, somebody said, I, I saw you at that workshop. We, we've, we're short of an actor. Like, do you want to come and do it? It's 30 quid. And then that was my first professional gig. I never had to do any open spots. I've, I've genuinely heard that story. Hmm. At the same time, other people have to trog away for years, sort of, you know, t- till they kind of be, can do, you know, be, can become professional, right? So look is part of it, but you can't do anything about that. Mm. Look is just there or it's not. Persistence, that is 
really important and that's about keeping going when it's demoralizing keeping going when you're just playing to other comics and their friends it's about it's about you know putting yourself out there it's keeping going keeping going not just keeping going not just doing the same thing but getting better and better and mm. better and and talent and you could do something about that which is right all the time and, and and when you've got a routine don't just think you've got to trot it out word for word when when a bit stops working either rejig it or take it out otherwise those words are dead as they come out of your mouth right um and what i sometimes see is that i'll have a group of students where there'll be two who are brilliant and others who are good and then maybe one or two who are struggling and the two, the two brilliant ones and you'll get one who's a dreamer and they're just not that well organized and you go you have a brilliant original voice and you're brilliant, but I just don't think you've got that thing of, you could have it, but you have to want it. It's kind of a bit like the thing they say about drug addicts, that they have to want it to kick the habit. It's like that in the reverse. You've got to really believe that it's going to happen. And, and, do it. and then you can have another one who's perhaps not quite as original, but is, but is good, is very, very good, they're very talented, and they have that kind of, I'm going to work, I'm going to work, and I'm going to work. And as an example of that, uh, in, what would it be now? I think 2012, I had a student, Alex Smith, who graduated, who did kind of funny songs. It was brilliant. I mean, just brilliant. What was brilliant about him was that he started off good and he worked and worked and worked. And even if he came off one of the student comedy nights and he just had a brilliant thing and everything had worked, he would be pumping me for what you know what can I get better at what's not as good what do I need to work at how can I stretch myself and when he finished I didn't you know one of the problems of doing what I do is that they they can get the feeling that they're brilliant at the end of it and they're done and that now all that's going to happen is a tv producer is going to see them and they're going to be on live at the Apollo or somebody at the comedy store is going to go come and headline right that's not going to happen and they have to know that they're they're only then at the beginning of a journey right so I remember seeing Alex at the end of his of his year and he went and I said how how's it going and he said well I've been doing some gigs and it's only really seeing other acts that I realize how far I've got to go and I thought yes that's a very good omen and you know and without you know it wasn't that long before Avalon picked him up it wasn't that long before he was on like live at the electric and things and it was it was that thing of he had that that thing of I've got my material I'm going to keep working at it I'm going to keep working as an act. I'm going to keep trying to get better. I'm going to keep putting myself out there. Mm. That's the difference. How you remember at the start you said like the key thing to being funny is to to connect with them and yeah. and to get them to believe that you are funny. Yes. How do you do that? <laughs> well, <laughs> How long I we think got? I think I think at some level, even if you're a really low status performer who plays on being a failure, I think at some level they kind of have to see control there. I think there are probably raw, raw, I think there are rare exceptions to that. I mean, I think when you read about Andy Kaufman's early stuff as foreign man coming out and pretending to be this dreadful person from some obscure country that people don't know and, 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 and appearing at the gig in role and leaving the gig in role, all the way staying in role and, and pretending to be really super bad, doing these terrible impressions... I think possibly people were laughing because they thought this was genuine because they, they bought into the fiction of it. But surely to God, when he then did the Elvis, the brilliant Elvis as the rockabilly cat era Elvis, people went, oh yeah, no, this is a put-on kind of thing. A bit like in Pappies, actually. There's a bit in Pappies where Matthew says to, to Ben, so have you got any plans for the weekend? And, and But he just says it like a casual question and Ben just goes, <laughs> well... <laughs> No, not really. It's like he's thrown by the question, and Matthew goes, "Well, well, are you sure you're not, you're not doing anything? You're not going out or anything?" He goes, "Well, no, no, not really. Well, I don't know. I was going to buy some gloves." And then, he, and then he gets the guitar out and they go to the gloves song, and everybody goes, "There's like a laugh because people go, oh yeah, we thought you were real there. We thought that was real. We thought you just created an awkward moment. We thought that you were really asking something and it went nothing, but actually it was all a setup." Yeah. I think that thing of feeling in safe hands. Like, I'll tell you a story against myself here. When I was comparing The Last Laugh in Sheffield, right, 
sometimes I would die as the compound, which is not great for the axe, but sometimes, you know, you're doing new material every week. And, and I think I didn't quite, I think I was too material focused. I think I didn't get into that thing of, well, if I play about with the audience a bit, if I improv a bit, if I, if I develop who I am and they have a sense of who I am, then, then I don't need to work as hard at the idea of doing shitty topical jokes, for example. And so some weeks it just wouldn't work, right? And I remember going out and just having a horrible opening and Ed Byrne coming on and being, have, you know, a first laugh because he was great. You know, he's a great act. He came out and he got that first laugh and that first laugh was bigger because everybody went, phew, here's somebody who can do it, right? Um, and I think that, that thing of control, everybody wants to see, everybody wants to sort of feel in safe hands. And if they're not in safe hands, Everybody wants to have, if, you know, if somebody is faking, if if the way it works is because somebody's faked dying to the point where it's funny, then they have to feel like they've discovered it kind of thing. That's a rarer thing, though. I think mainly it's people have to feel like you're in control. Even if it's Lee Evans and it's him, you know, tripping over or whatever it is, they have to, or a, 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 a kind of level underneath, they have to kind of know that he's in charge. So there's, there's kind of a, a willing sense of just, like sort of they've let reality go because they've sort of gone with the real, the world the comedian's creating, yeah. but also they've seen that this is they're not the, the comedian's not being overly arrogant. They're not coming out and going no. this is funny, but they're coming out and saying this is funny. It's like when I first started, I remember seeing performers. Like, I remember even like like I remember seeing like a like a theatre group or something in Nottingham, a club in Nottingham called Spots. There was there was a theatre group came out. They did a weird show. Like, 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 not, not even that funny. I mean, it was like a satirical thing. It was very funny in places. But I remember there were, perhaps there were four people in the group. I can't remember. It's an awful long time ago. Like, it's maybe 25 years ago or something. But I remember there was one guy, and I went, wow, that guy's just got it. He just, like, everybody laughs every time he says something. He, we, he, we feel more relaxed in his company. He seems more relaxed than ours. There's something about... Like, it's a bit like watching a sportsman or woman when they're just brilliant. You just go, ooh, you've got this now. Right, you know, you, you, you feel like, okay, this is... Yeah, you know what you're doing. You know, you totally know what you're doing. Um, so, so it's kind of that, I think. Um, at some level, you communicate. And also, it's not only that, it's also warmth. And, and you know, there's certain performers who are just really likeable like I think pappies so you watch them and you go oh my god I want these guys to be my mates you know these, 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 you know, there's something that communicates in, in variety they talk about warmth warmth it's what it's what communicates across the footlights it's what it's what people like I, I, I interviewed a guy who was who was a nephew by marriage of Gracie Fields right who you, we might just look back on as, oh, terrible, they liked anything in those days. Oh, her voice, it's awful, it's awful, you know. Oh, it's so, it's so mawkish, it's so sentimental. She was an amazing act. She was an amazing act. People forget how brilliant and how famous and popular she was on both sides of the Atlantic, right? But also there are recordings of her live, and they're brilliant, you know, brilliant, brilliant recordings of, of, of somebody really holding the audience in the palm of their hand. And this guy... Uh, went on to be his dad his mum and dad were famous variety agents both of them and he went on to be an agent through the latter years of variety into the you know beyond and he uh, he um, talked about being taken to see Gracie Fields in variety and he said I could see the audience and I thought why are they like that you know why are they they don't move. It's like they're hypnotised. They're transfixed. What's what what? Why is my what's my auntie done to them to make this happen? Uh, uh, and I think that there are things that you can pinpoint. I think if you watch something, if you watch somebody, I think that I think that great performers, great popular performers, know what it is. Like the Ramones. So I said a, a bit of a leap from Gracie Fields to the Ramones, right? But. Johnny Ramone used to talk about going to watch, watch bands when they were setting up the Ramones. You might look at the Ramones and go, well, they just did three chords and that was it kind of thing. But actually, they wore torn clothes. But they, they knew what they were doing and it was crafted and brilliant. And he talked about, you know, that band, they walk on great and that band, they don't. And that's true. Like, I've watched live music in the last week. I've, like, there's just been the Whisper Oyster Festival. We went past the band. And you watch this band and you go, 
okay, they can play. Okay, it's just three blokes with loads of technology and they can do a Frankie Goes to Hollywood cover because they're an 80s cover band and they can actually sound quite good. But they can't perform. They cannot engage an audience. Whereas some people, while Billy Childish, say, can completely own an audience because he's utterly charming and he engages with you as an honest human being somehow. That's what... I think that's... Because uh, there's something um, Logan Murray... Because a bit of background, I, I emailed you before I started and said, I've read your book. Can, yeah. I don't want to come to Kent because I don't want to learn there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Who should teach me? And you went, Logan. Logan's yeah, yeah, in yeah. London. And I did his course. And I remember Logan talking a lot about playing the room. Yes. And it's basically that. It's yes. you, it's you, you, you're not just going up and reciting lines like an actor would. You are aware of what's happening and you are aware of, of who, how you have to play that room to make them care about you and trust you. It's The key thing to it is it's... The reason that stand-up isn't thought of as theatre, even though it is theatre, by any normal definition mm. of theatre, the reason it's not thought of as theatre is because it's not a set text like, like a play is. You can sometimes get... You know, sometimes stand-up shows are published as books. Mm. Stuart Lee's a good example of the, how that's done well. Mm. But, for the, but that's really done for comedy nerds, I think, and people who are interested in what he does rather than somebody who's going to actually stage it. I can't imagine sixth form GC, you know, you know sixth form B Tech drama students going, right, I'm going to do 90s comedian, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, right. Um, so so uh, d- 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 Mark Thomas came out with this great line, which is it's, it's, a rec- it, it's, it's an encounter, not a recital. It's an encounter. Even if you've got all your material it has to be an encounter and you have to use that material to make an encounter with that audience because if it feels like it's a recital that's when the audience start going away from you yeah it's like it's like you can tell the difference when like you've spoken to a friend like say you're talking to a mate and they're they're telling you a story and you could tell they've said that story 20 or 30 times before yeah and you know they you know they're almost not interested in it anymore because they're sort of like, oh, I know exactly how he, when he's going to laugh. And, and You know what I mean? It's, it's just, it, it feels disingenuous. It doesn't feel like you're enjoying the moment with that person. It feels like you're just hearing the past conversation they've had, but with you now in it. I'm, I'm, I'm actually having that dilemma at the moment because I've recently broke my femur, right? Which is, you might go, oh, he's broken bone. That's, that's no big thing. But bear in mind that I was in hospital for eight days and I was on a Zimmer frame for a month. And it's a six-month recovery period. And uh, it was pretty, pretty uh, thorough going. In fact, I nearly just said a line. I nearly just said a line, <laughs> right, that I started saying when I just had the accident. And then I thought, oh, I, I started writing things down, like in a book, partly to kind of come to terms with what had happened, because it was a really, psychologically, it was like a massive blow. And um, I started writing things down in a book and drawing. I did drawings of people I was in hospital with and stuff like this. And then I went, oh, this will make an interesting show. And I, I went, okay, right, well, I'm going to go and see... I know the people who run the, the campus theatre, the, um, the Gorbenki, which is a public theatre, you know, it's a 330-seat theatre. I thought, well, you know, would you be interested if I wanted to do this? And they went, yeah. And then, and then it's like a thing, well, I'm not going to say that line because then it's like I'm testing out my material. Yeah. And also, if people stop laughing, yeah. then I'm, kind of, I'm going to kind of go, I've got no material for my show. Yeah. So it goes from being something you say to people to being material. Yeah. And there, there are a couple of things... Uh, like, like there's a line I could have said to you just then, right? Which is just my observation about something that the doctor said to me when it first happened, right? And it's just like a one... I'm not really... I don't write one lines. I'm not clever enough for that. Uh, most of my stuff is like anecdotal kind of observation. It's about small detail about the way people interact with each other and often just spotting things where it's kind of a funny thing and most people probably go past without thinking it's a funny thing. And I just report it. That's all I do, right? Uh, but this one was like... A, it was like I just took the logic of what had been said to me and just spun it on its head by referring to something else. But I'm not going to tell you it now because otherwise it would feel disingenuous. Well, I think everyone wants to know. Oh, we, we'll come oh, to the show. Have we all come to the show? If you want to see it, right, it's at the Gulbenkian on the 6th of December. And if you want to see it for free, I'm going to try and record it and put it online somewhere. Like, like either it'll go on YouTube. I, 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 I've talked to the theatre about, about using it as a test for them to do... You know, like you know, like you get the National Theatre connection. You know, the, the you know where you go and see it in a theatre. It's filmed and broadcast. Like, yeah. We're trying, you know, potentially going to try and do it to YouTube. That's an idea we've we've kicked around. If that doesn't happen, 
hopefully it'll be filmed and go to YouTube. But if that doesn't happen, I'm going to audio record it, and that's definitely going to go online, right? So you, you get a chance. Yeah, and then yeah, you'll, yeah. You, you then will be the judge, well, <laughs> whether it's good or shit. I will make sure that it gets shared, and we've got a group for this okay, great. thing. So hopefully a few people will watch it. And hopefully, even fewer people. No, they like because like, you trickle it down, don't you? Yeah, yeah. Like, do you know what I mean? Like statistically, a well, hundred people come see you, ten people are going to hate you. You yeah, know, or, or tw- absolutely. You know, in my case, 20. I, mean, I mean, you have to bear in mind, I'm doing this show for myself. It's not. <laughs> it doesn't even like last time I did a solo show. I did this show uh, called Saint Pancreas, and it was based on the idea that. I, I have two children with type 1 diabetes, which might not sound that big of a deal, but it is, it's, it is, it's something that affects your whole life. I mean, Tom was a baby. I mean, he was less than two years old. And when he was diagnosed, because it was misdiagnosed initially, he nearly died. And that was a really scary and terrible thing to happen. But once it was obvious that he wasn't going to die, the trauma started to ebb away. And I started think, finding things quite funny about what had happened in retrospect. And over a period of about over five years, more and more ideas came for what I could talk about to do with this. And it, it became a show that I did in Whitstable in 2006. But there was a kind of research imperative there. There's a thing in, in, in um, drama, university drama, which is called... Pra- well, it's not just in drama, it's in, in creative arts subjects. It's called Practices Research. And the idea is that you can find out about the nature of let's say in this case performance not just by reading books about it or whatever but by actually going out and trying something and seeing how it works and just really kind of taking creative risks and seeing what happens as a result so I thought wouldn't it be quite interesting to do a stand-up show where you talk about really quite thoroughgoing emotional things now obviously since then that's almost become a cliche you know the Edinburgh show where somebody talks about their dad dying or whatever it is but I trust me nobody had I wasn't aware I, I was aware of people Pryor, Richard Pryor would sort of do that. But I wasn't aware of British comedians particularly playing with that. There there are a few examples. I mean, Andre Vince had done his Hooray for Cancer show. Mark Thomas had done uh, Dam Busters, which ends with this this very dark tirade about oppression in in Turkey. Um, And there there were a few other examples, but, but not many people had sort of done that. And I thought, well, wouldn't it be quite interesting to try and do, you know, a, a show you know where I talk about something quite quite taboo I mean a child nearly died right wouldn't it be quite interesting to see if you can take people to somewhere which is quite dark and then see if you can still make them laugh Mm. and I wanted it to be emotional and empathetic but I didn't want the laughter to completely go away I mean there were moments when it did but I wanted the laughter to come back in and it's a pretty lumpy show because I only ever performed it once I don't have the kind of following that will allow me to do a shit version of a show for, for a month before I do it right. So it was like an all or nothing thing. And so therefore it's lumpy as hell. There are bits that don't work. There are bits which are forced. There are bits that go on too long. But, I, but because I wanted it to be an output, because I wanted it to be a research thing, I, I basically filmed it in the cheapest, crappiest way possible. And using the model of Go Faster Stripe, thought, well, we could just distribute it through the university, through the university website. So you, if you're interested in it, I think it costs like eight quid. You can go and see it, right? This one that I'm doing, I couldn't really think of a research project it relates to. It's sort of similar to the previous one in the sense of, I'm hoping there's going to be some quite dark moments in it because I want to consider the inevitability of our own death, right? As well as, as, well as a funny thing about a, a thing that an old guy said to me in the hospital mm. ward or whatever. Um, but, um, it, but I can't do that again. I've done that. It can't be a second research project. There, you know, there might be some things I'll write about it in the future. But I'm really doing it for me because I don't have to make money out of comedy anymore. And in fact, if I make any money out of doing this, I'm going to give it to charity. I don't want to make any money out of it. I want to do something that's interesting for me and hopefully interesting for the audience. Either that or it's going to be a very long night for everybody. (laughs) That's genuinely a possibility. Yeah, yeah. As someone, I sort of have a day job, sort of, I uh, freelance in and out. So sometimes I I sort of have that. I like like kind of when I have a job because then I can sort of go, I don't need to make money from comedy. I can just do the thing I want to do. And then I go full time again and I'm like, I do need to make money from comedy. And it's just that awkward, like, balancing act of. There, there is something to be said for doing something just purely for the love of it. You, I mean, it's. I, I liked when, when I used to make a living from doing comedy. Uh, I liked that, and I was proud of it. And I don't like the fact that it's not as easy to do that as it used to be. Genuinely, you used to go to go. I, I did five minutes. Oh, sorry. sorry, I did five minutes at the Banana in 1989, right? In uh, probably the autumn of 1989, in the Ballon Banana. 
and it went really well. And then they, I think they booked me t- to 20 on, for, for money on the basis of that. Like, that's how open mics used to work. You'd go to a professional night, they'd put you on to a proper audience, not just an audience of comedians and their mates. And if it went well, they would book you. That's how it used to work. And I think that's how it should be. I think, it's, I think if you're running a night where you, the only way you can fill it up is to get the acts to bring two mates, then you're not doing it right. Mm. I don't believe that people don't want to come to live comedy. I know there's a crisis in it. But also, there are ways of getting people on board. Yeah. As, to run comedy, there are ways of getting people on board. Yeah, the, there's two questions that came out. Because in your book, you have a chapter called Why Bother? Yeah. And, it, and it's literally, it's great. It's literally just like uh, how hard it's going to be if you're looking into it and, and like why you should bother if you want to and like whether you have that drive. And like you said, I mean, uh, it's it sort of massively changed and it's become, uh, I mean, do you think it's become harder now because there's more comedians? Or yes. Do you think, okay, because there's but more clubs as well. So Yeah, I mean... <laughs> but you also commented a little bit about the circuit being in crisis. And I mean, is... Well, I think I think I think what's happened is that what used to happen. I mean, if you look, if you get the trajectory of it, when alternative comedy first started in you know in the late seventies, early eighties, you had a number of different people coming through. You had people like I suppose John Dowie and Malcolm Hardy who'd sort of been doing different things for a while, and then you had people like who came out through sort of alternative theatre. So you had. Uh, Alexi Sale who'd done Thropoli Theatre and you had Jim Barkley who'd done like 784 and you had Pauline Melville who'd done Sadistic Sisters and then you had Rick Mail and Ed Edmondson who'd come up through Student Review you know through Manchester doing 20th Century Coyote and you had French and Saunders who'd sort of done Student Review as well and, and you know various other people as well and, um, and, and, and actually they kind of broke through quite quickly because actually things like the comedy store the comic strip quite quickly had media paying attention so by the time you were, I mean Comedy Store opened in May 1979 um, Alternative Cabaret Tony Allen's group started doing things I think in 1979 and uh, the comic strip started I think in 1980 maybe something like that I think Tony Allen and Alexis Sale were the first comics of that generation to go to the Edinburgh Fringe in I think 1980 right and by 1982 you had the young ones on television mm. And you had the, the opening night of Channel 4 had the comic strip presents. So, the, the, you know, those people got picked up quite quickly. But then there was a whole generation where telly wasn't interested particularly anymore. Not in that same way. So there were brilliant, brilliant people like, say, Jeremy Hardy or Mark Steele or Linda Smith or Mark Thomas, who for quite a while, or, or you know, for that matter, sort of Paul Merton or, or you know, various other people, who for quite a while, uh, you know, were, were, were brilliant live acts, but, but, but we were only doing bits and bobs on the telly, who weren't, like, properly picked up and developed in the same way as, say, Rick Mayle had been, right? Um, and then I suppose things changed with when Jack D and Joe Brand and people like that started getting picked up, and I suppose Steve Coogan and uh, Vic Reeves and people like that started getting picked up by telly and it became a thing again. But then, what, but the most recent wave of that is that in the last 10 years, a huge change, huge change between the first and second edition of Getting the Joke. Getting the Joke was written in the, in the, in the lead up to the first series of Live at the Apollo when it was still Jack D Live at the Apollo. Right, and uh, I remember Ross Noble telling me about it in an interview, and he, he was like, "Well, you know, this new program. Everybody says stand-up doesn't work on telly, but this program is doing it differently. This is going to work, and of course it has. Uh, and 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 now stand-up on telly is a thing, right? And there's and there's a, a way of doing it, which is you get a massive venue, you put some celebrities in the front row, you 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 let people do a little bit longer than they were allowed to do, and then suddenly people are able to break through, or you put them on mock the week, and then they kind of develop." Um, that way and so what then there is this is a very long answer to that question but what happens then is that you can get people going from nothing to stadium in quite a short amount of time right and they might be a brilliant act but the problem with that is it becomes like pop music you know the Beatles really paid their dues before they became a big act 
because they played Hamburg and they played Cellars and they, they, they became like an amazing live act, right? So the, by the time they broke through, they really had their chops. Like they knew how to write a song, they knew how to perform. And I think that possibly that element has gone out because you can, you can get somewhere like super quick. And, and I think that, that, you know, when people like Eddie Izzard broke through, he worked really hard to build his audience, really hard. He started playing venues too big for him and touring. When the idea of a comedian touring from the circuit, touring under their own name, was really quite rare. And then he built his audience. And I think that that's what made him in the 90s. I mean, it's interesting, you look back at his DVDs now and you kind of go, this is good, but it feels a bit old. Right, but prom- I promise you, a lot of what he was doing in the '90s, a lot of the kind of meta stuff he was doing, like "Note to Self, Never Say That It Again," that was that people didn't do that. People didn't do that messing about stuff that he did. People didn't do that freewheeling surreal stuff. He was groundbreaking because he worked mm. hard as a live act. And the worry, I suppose, about somebody going from naught to sixty in 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 a short amount of time through doing some good work on mock the week or something is that you, you know that, that 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 you miss out on that 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 time of creativity with with working a live audience night after night after night that said it's not a simple matter milton jones has been a brilliant act a brilliant brilliant act for a long time and i'm delighted that mock the week has given him the, the audience that he deserved all along mm. It's not a long answer. That's a that's a that's a concise answer of anything because uh, you've got to look at the history of how it got to where it was. Do you know? Yeah. What I mean? You can't like I, I most of the people I talk to, as in like general comedians, sort of look at stuff at, as how it is now. Yeah. And don't have the knowledge the long base. View. You, yeah, exactly. And it's quite nice because you sort of you've done comedy and you've yeah. obviously you're still a performer, but you you now study it and teach yeah, yeah, it, yeah. which means you have this perspective on it, which means that you can not only look at it as as one of us, as it were, yes. but you can also look at it as one of one of I don't know sort of the elders of you yeah, know yeah, some yeah, sort yeah. of outsider and it's I mean as as a teacher of comedy do you find I mean because there's been a whole like load of cuts uh, arts wise recently and there's also been generally less and less support I mean I remember when I did Logan's course mm. he was talking about how you could uh, find funding to like do comedy or like housing uh, subsidies I for could, comedians I could tell you about that actually. I mean, actually, when alternative comedy first started, one of its things, bizarrely for something that was left wing, one of its things was without subsidy, that it, that market forces should dictate what's good because otherwise things get flabby. And bear in mind, a lot of these work for left wing subsidised theatre, uh, but a lot of them argued that and even joked about it on stage. Like Alexi Sale had a joke at the expense of Seven Eighty Four, for example. Uh, but. Um, but, you, but, the, but there were kind of weird forms of subsidy. For example, Cass New Variety, which was important, an important and, and, and actually slightly forgotten aspect of the circuit, of helping the circuit to grow, because they had a club and then they had lots, and then they reopened the Hackney Empire, it having gone dark, for, you know, as a theatre anyway, for, for a number of years. I mean, it, it closed in the mid-50s as a theatre, and then it was a bingo hall, and they brought it back from the dead, right? Now, when they were building their circuit, they had a grant from the GLC to do that, right? And then the other thing is that, that the other form of subsidy that stand-up had was from breweries. A lot of clubs, you know, in the 90s, there were a lot of clubs called things like 4X that was, you know, 4X, whatever the brewery would be, you know, that, that subsidised it. Or, you know, I can't remember the other one, Foster's Comedy Night or Guinness Comedy Night, whatever it would be. I remember once playing a Pro Plus Comedy Night, genuinely, in, in a student union. But anyway, uh, the other form of the the other one that Logan was probably talking about, there was a thing called the Enterprise Allowance Scheme, and it wasn't made with comedians in mind. But basically, it was saying, well, go out because it was part of the Thatcherite political philosophy. Go out there and start a small business. And how it worked, I was on the Enterprise Allowance Scheme. How it worked was, you went off uh, benefits, so that was good for the government because it was better for their figures, right? You went off benefits, but you could still claim housing benefit, I think. But what happened was, you were off you know supplementary benefit as it was then or job seekers allowance as it would be now and they paid you i think it was when i did it 50 pounds a week and then you got a certain amount of business coaching which was rubbish terrible and a lot of the i mean i remember going to the opening you know sort of induction for it and some people left before the end of the day because they clearly realized they weren't businessmen or women right but I did it for a year and it was a great way of getting established financially because by the end of the year 
you know, it meant you didn't have to lie, you didn't have to hide your earnings. Uh, you got you, you got terrible business advice, but you know you, you might you might learn how to do double entry bookkeeping or something that was helpful, and it, and it, that allegedly was what made that was a big factor according to a lot of people in you know the spread of alternative comedy because it allowed you to give up your day job if you wanted to do that took a bit of pressure off, and then you know you could do what you wanted to do so yeah and those things obviously they haven't existed for a long time. They should bring it back. Yeah. They should bring back the Enterprise Allowance Scheme for performers. Did you know that in the, uh, in the Great Depression of the 30s, part of the Roosevelt New Deal uh, was a thing called the Federal Theatre Project, where the government put huge subsidies into the arts to get theatre workers at all levels, from backstage crew to even old vaudeville performers. And not only did it work, because it created phenomenally popular theatre, but it was also brilliantly innovative. Orson Welles started his career partly in the... Um, he did a version of an all-black production of, I think, Macbeth in Harlem. Uh, but they also did these living newspaper shows, which were issue-based, uh, you know, incredible-sounding shows. There was one where it was about poor housing, and it started with a faked fire in a tenement building so they had a tenement building in cross section on the stage which went apparently on fire in front of your very eyes wow. and, and the government put money into it and the government also put money into build, rebuilding roads and because it's basic keynesian economics which is something people have forgotten now like they go you have to pay off the national debt you have to do it that's the only way you can pay it off no it's not like a household debt it's like a business. If you put money in, if the government puts, borrows money and puts it into road building and things, people are then in employment, they spend more money, and that's how economies recover. People have forgotten that. The government should, what I'm saying is, pay comedians. Yeah. Make, make, you know, make a massive recovery in the comedy circuit by bringing back the Enterprise Allowance Scheme. Are you listening, Tories? <laughs> no, probably no, not. No Tories listen to my podcast. No, probably I, not. I specifically ban them. They're not allowed to <laughs> they wouldn't but, care anyway. No, they they wouldn't. don't care. No, I mean, the, I mean, do you think there's a government move to d- maybe squeeze out more of the arts or, or make it harder because it's not immediately as profitable in their eyes? I think I think evidence shows that the money you invest in the arts, you get back many times over. Um, it, the government is doing what they're doing because they hate the welfare state and they don't. They like rich people and they don't like people who aren't rich. I, 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 this sounds like lefty conspiracy theory, but if you if you look at their actions, there's a lot in that. If you look at what happened in the last budget, I think I think the, I think the, that um, I think that stand-up is a special case because it's never it, it's never got direct subsidy, or very very rarely has it got direct subsidy from government. And even when you know, in the case of Cast, that was a left-wing local council, Ken Livingston's GLC, that did that because Ken Livingston realised the value of the arts. So as, a, as a teacher of comedy, mm-hmm. you've obviously seen a wide scope of different performance levels and intelligences. Yeah. I mean, do you, do you think a, a highly intelligent person or, or a foolish kind of um, naive person who can see the world in a certain, like, different way it makes a better comedian? I think they're just different. I think, I think that said, I think for somebody to... I think for somebody to be... Uh, no, I think, I, think that, um, I think that I like clever comedy and I like dumb silly comedy and that and the truth is it's never dumb it's never dumb um you know even when somebody appears to be i tell you andy parsons used to have a very interesting act years ago i saw him a number of times in his early days before he was doing mock the week and he used to do i'm just a fit cockney bloke that was one of his things he didn't say that but he did some brilliant jokes some br- i mean he was a he's like a cambridge graduate or something isn't he andy parsons he did, some, he did some brilliant jokes, brilliant jokes about being fat and thick. It, like he did this whole thing about, um, I'm so fat now, I can't see my own penis. Uh, sometimes what I do is have a little fiddle with it so I can see it again. But then if I could see it again, I think I could have another biscuit. Right. It's just brilliant. Just a brilliant, just brilliant jokes along those lines. Um, and I think people used to, I heard that people gave him a hard time because they said, well, you know, you're pretending to be something you're not. You know, you're not really that thick. And I kind of think, well, how stupid are you? Sometimes people are on stage because that's the magic of theatre, thicko. You know, I mean, you know, Max Miller wasn't really a libertine, not in the way that he was in his act. But does that make him any lesser of a giant of 20th century comedy? No, it doesn't. 
Now, Andy Parsons did a great act. It worked in its own, own terms. Does it matter that he was that, that was disingenuous? No, because it was an act, right? Um, so I think I think even when people, but, but you know, you know, the other, you know, I'm not saying that somebody who's, you know, I, I've seen some incredibly clever material by people who haven't had been through say higher education, who came from a very sort of ordinary working class background, but who are just brilliant. I think I think that, that every comic is clever, and every I think to be a stupid comic, you've either I don't know, you've either got to be just incredibly lucky that your stupidity manifests itself as funniness or that there's somebody very clever working with you to help to find what's funny about you but I think that I mean Stan Laurel right his persona was stupid he was the stupider of the two but he was as is well known the brains behind the team he was the one who put more time into honing it who you know timed the test footage that they did with audiences timed how long the last was recut things and all that he wasn't stupid. Of course he wasn't. He was a genius. Do you know what I mean? I mean, Buster Keaton had the naive, innocent thing. Buster Keaton was a genius, obviously. He couldn't have made those films if he wasn't incredibly clever. I think you have to be clever to be, do comedy because, it, it, because comedy plays with perception. It plays with... You, you have to be able to understand how other people are seeing things. And you have to be able to make weird associations. That's the basic format of comedy is incongruity, which is just about thinking in an unconventional way. And I love, you know, I mean, sometimes people only really like, people are comedy snobs and they only really like something like Stuart Lee or something like that. I love Stuart Lee or Daniel Kitson. They're brilliant acts. But I also like Sarah Millican or, you know... um, you know, I think Ross Noble is an extraordinary act. I think sometimes people people perhaps underrate how extraordinary he is because they go, it's just silly, it's just fluffy. It isn't. Well, first of all, what's wrong with it if it is? Because actually we need that. And then secondly, I've seen Ross do some extraordinary things which are way beyond just fluffy. But, they, but, but people think it's fluffy because you have a good time while you're with him, right? Because he's an extraordinary performer. Right, I'm, t- I'm going to end it there if that's all right. That's so, fine. Thank you very much for coming on. That was Oliver. Uh, I hope you really enjoyed that. I got proper comedy nerdy with him. I don't know if that was obvious to you, but I really loved talking to him. I thought he was a fascinating person to talk to. We've actually talked about potentially doing a follow-up pod because I had so many questions to ask him and a bunch of additional things that would um, definitely be worth talking to him about and, and getting him on a future episode or a panel because I've got some panel ideas for people I'd like to have on. So if you'd like that to happen, please let me know, email me, or join the Facebook group. It's called Ask the Industry Podcast, and of course it's on Facebook. Uh, and that's the only place you can find us. We just have a community on there. I don't have a Twitter feed or anything. Um, although I do have a newsletter, but you can join that on my website. So yeah, uh, do join the Facebook group because it has the most up-to-date information for guests and uh, like where you can ask questions and pass on information and have chats about things to do with the industry and try and improve. We've got loads of stuff that I'm working on in there. And it would be great to have you on board and working on it with me. If you like this episode, please share it with a friend. All the shares really help. Even if even if you just tweet the link or, or share it on Facebook, tag me in it because it, it does help. Like genuinely, a lot of my listens come from referrals and shares. So I really need that support to carry on. Uh, if you uh, want to do a little bit more for me, please leave it an iTunes review. Just leave it an honest one. It doesn't matter if you think it's four stars. Uh, I'd love it if you thought it was five stars. But um, just be honest with your review. Leave me like a few sentences about who you have enjoyed listening to, why you've listened to it, and who you'd maybe like me to bring on. Really help out in future guests and getting people down. If you would like to donate, uh, there's a PayPal button on my website, which is simoncain.co.uk. That's S-I-M-O-N-C-A-I-N-E.co.uk. Um, yeah, if you, if you go there, whatever you think it's worth, you know, a couple of quid an episode, you listen to five episodes, send me a couple of quid times five. That's, yeah, again, um, as I said at the start, I'm not going to patronise you on how mass works. Um, if you would like to do it a different way, you can become a patron. Uh, patrons are my are my favourite uh, kind of way you can donate uh, or, or, or support the podcast because uh, it means that I have a budget for every show. At the moment, I'm getting $51 an episode, which works at about £30, maybe uh, £28, uh, after I've brought it over from the US because it's an American site um, and converted it into English money and brought it through PayPal. So um, 
it's you know it's building and it's a useful amount of money because if I have to take a train for example to Kent to go and see Oliver again or uh, I've got a few other people I'm going to travel to go and interview in the next couple of weeks it really helps out with me not having to you know lose money on train fare um, or uh, yeah just it it's obvious how, how it helps out but yeah it would be really great to get that over our next target which is $75 so if if 24 of you can donate $1 that would be amazing because it would get me over that next hump. Um, or 12 of you do too. Whatever you, whatever works out best for you guys. You guys get together and have a chat about that. Thank you very much for sharing. Thank you very much for supporting. Thank you very much for listening. I will see you in about a week. Bye.